Hand up? Okay. Yeah, I went to the shooters because I was trying to figure out how to, I mean, <coughs> trying to understand it. Yes. And that the, the, the bottom part where we had 72.0 to 75.0. Oh. Um, yeah. I went to two different shooters. They told me that I cannot change it. And I told them about this. They told me I can to include that, that uh, highest number. But they said no, it cannot be. Well, it depends on who they were taught by. It depends yeah, on your was, teacher and so forth. Yeah. It's common practice to do that, and that's the only time you ever change the width of a class, is right. if the next data point is right next to it. You go ahead and suck it in. Okay. Some students might have been taught by a different teacher that said, no, never do that. Yeah. But they're kind of doing something out. I was confusing because I went to, to two different triggers and I had the same problem. Well, that's not. Hopefully, you understand that that by itself is not like a big deal. Right? That's not like you should feel, I'm going to give all the statistics up because I can't get that last class right. What I more care about is do you understand the process? Do you understand how to put it together? Do you understand how to make a picture based off of your table? Those are the big things, <coughs> right? Cool. And that's what everybody should agree on. So I think last time I managed to talk a little bit about how to set up at least the classes. So first off, we realized that that six is an outlier. Somebody left off, they, maybe they meant to say 60 and the zero key is sticky, so it didn't hit the zero, right? So we gotta throw that out. We don't wanna let that throw off our data. We cannot always identify the data points that are not good. Which is why we want to take large samples to kind of make the effect of those go down. Um, remember the width. Oh, this is going to be great. The, the width is the range divided by how many classes you want to use. And I try to make a physical situation out of that, like trying to put chalkboard plants up here. You just say, how far do I want to go? And that's how far from 75 down to 60. That's how far I want to go divided by how many planks I want to use. I think most of you guys might have used five, I used six. We both came up with three. I rounded up to three for a class width. So here's the weird part. The data itself has decimals in it. So if you want to do it the book method, <coughs> oh, that's going to be great. If you want to do it the book method, you actually do have to take into account that your data has decimals. You have to have decimal limits. So 60, 63, 66, that's where I can see the 3. But then that makes this number 62.9. It's got to be directly next to the other one. So it just has to be right next to whatever you're Exactly. Doing. So if it's whole numbers, it would be like 60, 63. This would be 62. This will be 3 of 65. If it was single decimal places, Here's my 60.0, 63.0. So I can see my width of three there, right? Mm -hmm. But then you got to go down by one according to how many decimal places you have. Here's one whole number. Here's one decimal place down. If it was two decimal places, what would it be? 60.0, 63.0, 62.0, 62. Cool. Mm -hmm. Right? Now the funny thing is every single one of these situations looks the same if I use the way that I was taught, 60 to 63, 63 to 66. That covers all this crap, right? Which is why I don't understand why the books nowadays are not teaching that way. I'm not sure why they're teaching this way. Because this is perfectly valid. Your class limits are your boundaries. You never have to worry about decibels because this has, there's no ambiguity here. Where's 62.8 go? Here. Where 63 go? Go. There? Cool. There's no ambiguity there. It may. Here, if I had 62.5 and I did it like this, where would 62.5 go? There's two places for it. That's why I've got to take it down one more decimal place to make a, a true place for 62.5 to go. So here? Yeah, yes. 63.0 and 62.5. 0.1, exactly. 0.1. And this will be 63, I'm sorry, 65.9. Um, 
kind of ring. This uh, this uh, boundary would be 59 and a half. This boundary would be 59.95. This boundary would be 59.995. You just have to go out some more decimal places as you go out more decimal places in your list. Yeah. which we can't do for this data. Why can't I use whole numbers for this data? Because there's decimal data in there. So I can't do it this way. How to make uh, to the maximum for this? I try to figure You have to do it like this? You have to do it like this to make root, right? So now where would 62.5 go? Uh, it would go up here. Where would 62.9 go? The top. The top one, yeah. But you can see now, where was 62.95 go? <coughs> Shit, well, if that's in my data list, I've got to go out one more place here to find a room for that, right? That's the problem with the, the way the book teaches it. There's not a problem with it, really. I want you to understand. I've got to be careful how I say that, because I personally like this way better. That doesn't mean that there's a problem with the other way, right, in general, to be objective. That's a perfectly valid way to do it, but it definitely makes you have to be a little more precise, depending on what your data is. Right. If I got one more decimal place, oh crap, I better make a list that has one more decimal place in it so I have room for everybody. Now where's 62.95 go? It would go in the first class. No question. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. I don't want this to become like a major sticking point. Right? In fact, the book kind of helps you out a little bit when your data has decimals in it. They say make classes from 20.0. Well, they're trying to tell you you want to put a 20.0 in your list. They're trying to tell you this is how you have to make it. Okay. <coughs> but the procedure, if you, if you divorce that whole decimal place issue, the procedure is pretty freaking easy. You put your data into your calculator. You sort it. Right, so what we did last time, if you weren't here last time, uh, you want to print out that calculator Bible and tell me if it makes sense how to do it. It tells you how to do every step. Um, calculate how wide your classes will be. Make your classes and then just count how many are in each class. The issue is sometimes your classes have to be a little more precise, more decimal places, but that's a separate issue. I want to, the process is what's more important. Does everybody understand the process, how to create this? You get a little frequency, you'll get your relative frequency. And the last little evil thing I did is I asked for a frequency histogram, not a relative frequency histogram. So I want the pure numbers here, not the percentages. Right, so pay attention to what, if I ask for a relative frequency, I want these to be percentages. Yep. How do you choose your bottom numbers? Like I don't choose them. Once you change I have to look at this and say, what's right below 60.0? 59.95. What's right above 62.9? 62.95. So forth, right? All right, so here we go. We got 60, uh, where are you? 60.0 to 62.9, 63.0 to 65.9, so forth, right? This one's a little bit strange, and I agree with you a little bit, but you, all, you always go up and down by like a half, but you've got to go out one more decimal place. So 0 0.05 down from this will be 59.95. Here's even a better way to look at this. Don't think about the decimal. What's right below 600? If I had 600 to something, to 629, what would this be? 599.5, right? Well, the decimal's here. Oh, crap. There. There you go. 59.95. So a lot of times in mathematics, not thinking about the decimal place actually helps you do a lot of things as long as you put it back in, put the decimal place back in at the end. Yeah? Well, I think the book does it um, pretty easy. You just take the the first number of the second set and then the second number of the first set and divided by two. Well, you add them and then divide it by two. You, you, you take like, a, oh, do you get this number? Or do yeah, you get the middle? Or, yeah, like 63.0 and then you add 62.9 just divide it by and two. And then divide by two. So get the average of these two. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Cool. The nice thing is once you get the first one, you just keep adding the width. Yeah. So once you get one of them, you're golden, right? Because then the next one will be what? The width was three. 
So what's 59.95 plus 3? And see how that's right in between these two? Cool. But yeah, you can always do an average of these two here because that's where it's got to match up. It's got to match up in between these two so that there won't be any gaps. They have to be right on top of each other so there won't be any gaps. Okay, most of your data is going to be non-decibel data for doing these things. But when you can see when they get decibel data, you do have to be a little more careful with your classes. Okay, yeah. Jeff, uh, with your method, we don't have to worry about this decimal. Right? Yeah, all that crap. Okay, okay. how many dust places you go out, it'll look like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. People don't like this method because it's got inequalities and it's got X's in it, but you really shouldn't be that scared of those. Right? You still go up and down like point five. Nope. To make this, it would be 60, 63, 66. Because for this one, my limits are my boundaries. Okay. Yeah. So, so in this case, you would make the the list like this, or would you still make the list like that? Yeah, I would make the list like that if I'm doing the book way. I would make the list like this <laughs> if, doing if I'm doing it the other way. Okay. Right. It's not really my way, but yeah, it's I just know, the other I way. Know. Yeah. Your preferred method. Oh, I, I I did both ways actually. I wanted six classes the way I did it, so I was cool with adding one more class. Right. So I had six. If you wanted five classes, remember this is the one time you can suck that last data point in. Make one last class, 72 to 75. What would you do for the class boundary for that, though? Would you go to 75.5? 75.5, or, or 0.05, yeah. In this case, 0.05. Okay. Since you've got to go out two places, yeah. Can you raise it? Oh. So now you guys see, here's the... 59.95 to 62.95, so forth. So there's no gaps. So it doesn't look like you missed anybody. And then you just make the height the same as the frequency. This goes up to 10. This goes up to 14, so forth. Do you guys, um, this is not perfect because it's kind of a small sample. And there are fewer men than women in here, just a little bit fewer men than women. What do you think this peak here corresponds to? Possibly. I mean, that's roughly right around that's five foot three, five foot four. Average. That's the average height of who? Women. Women. This other kind of peak here, that contains the average height of men, which is five foot nine. Right? Which is kind of nice to see. I didn't, I didn't make this happen. This is what actually naturally happened. You see kind of a nice, the women go up and down. There's a little bit of overlap with the women and the men. There are some tall women. And then the men go up and down. Right? Everybody know what that shape is called when you have a nice bell curve? Yeah, bell curve. It's also called a normal curve. If I look at everybody at once, is that a nice bell curve? No, it kind of goes like that. Right? It's not really normal. It's not a bell curve. If I look at women and men separately, you actually do get a nice bell curve. So, and that's actually the last part of the section. This is a perfect way to get into that. We call it a normal curve because it's what occurs naturally. For example, if I took uh, fish and I took them when they're adults and I saw and I measured a bunch of fish, I would see some small fish and some really long fish, but most of them should be the average. Most of them should be right in the middle. So I'd have um, like this. I'd have some small fish, some long ass fish, but most of them should be right in the middle, right? And that's why this extreme is coveted. If you get one of those extremes, you, get, you pick it up, you put it, you're up in the paper somewhere. I don't know if there's any fish, anybody fish in here? I don't, because I have extreme seasickness. It's awesome. <laughs> but um, that's what that is. Or, or heights, the same way. Here's the uh, average height of men. So are there like a lot of people that are, a lot of men that are three feet tall? Right, three or four feet tall? There are not many, but there are some. Mm -hmm. Are there a lot of men that are seven foot? No, there are not many, but there are some. Where are most men? Here. Cool. How are we doing with that? So that's why we call it a normal curve, because what happens normally is I get that. In fact, if, if any of your teachers ever curve your grades? Mm -hmm. So that's where the middle is normally a C, and you expect some kids to get fail and some kids to get A's and stuff. So they say, okay, crap, my middle was actually uh, 31 out of 100. I'm going to make that C. So I'm basically going to pick this whole thing up and put it up at C territory. Right? And then these guys are going to fall into A's and these are going to fall into D's and F's. 
So that's one way to kind of curve grades. Just pick up the whole picture and put it up, bam, make the middle seat. Don't make everybody fail, right? Okay, if you haven't had that happen yet, it happens a lot in higher level classes. In grad school, if you go to grad school, good God, you never get out if they didn't curve grades. Yeah? When you're doing the decimals for making class boundaries, the, the start of the, the next um, class boundary will be the same number as the ending of the Exactly. Okay. Good. Because what do we not want to have happen when we actually make the picture? Yeah. Don't want to have gaps. gaps. So I do want the one to lie right on top of the other one. And that's why if I did have a data point that was 62.95, I couldn't do this because then where would it go? So I'd have to pull out one more decimal place to make sure where that goes, right? And that's this whole thing about how many decimals do I actually have to have in my classes so I can fit all my data in. Depends on how many decimal places my data go out to. Thankfully, nobody told me they were 62.95 inches tall, which is good, right? But you could have if you really wanted to. Hmm. If you do it that way, how could you graph it on that? It would be just like this. It would be, if I did it the inequality way, it would be 60, 63, 66, 69. Bah, bah, bah. So where, um, 63, <coughs> um, Say again? So where 63 would be like on the left or on the left? No, you, you tell me where would 63 fall? Which class? The second one. See? There's no ambiguity because you're saying that's strictly less than. But what's less than 63? 62.99999999. So I don't care how many freaking decimal places you want to give me, I have a place for it. Whereas if I do it this way, oh shit, oh shit, maybe I don't have enough place for it, I better add some more decimal places. Do you guys kind of see the point here? All right, what I really want you to do is to do 2223 homework as soon as you can. They kind of guide you a little bit in the setup. <coughs> you need to do some of these histograms to make sure you know. Remember what I said about 2223? Two, 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 you want to do them at once, right? Don't hand in 2 2 because it refers to your work in 2 2 in section 2 3. That would suck. Okay. But, yep. but do, you go, do you go for each individual one or do you just, okay, since you got the first one, 60 is less or equal to um, X. And X. Which is less than 63. So do you just keep adding them like that? Oh yeah, same way I do okay. when I make these. What do yeah, we do to keep okay. going? Keep adding three, adding three until we get to the end. Okay. Yeah, you do exactly the same way there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Maybe. All right. So you just got to get into that section two, two, and two, three, and try it out to make sure you can do it. Hopefully, that handout I gave you gives you a nice template to follow, right? You have to know the formula for class width. It's a little <coughs> tiny formula. You've got to be able to calculate class width yourself. Don't just tell me 10. Why? Because I like it. No, you got to back it up. You've got to show me the work, the math. Okay. So, real quick question. Um, which one of these would you say then is a normal curve? Uh, if I had something like this here. This here. The first one. First, first one's definitely normal. normal. It's pretty good and normal, right? The second one, I wouldn't say it's normal. I'd say it's approximately normal. Could I still sort of fit a bell curve over it? Mm -hmm. It kind of doesn't follow a rule in a couple places there, but isn't it close to normal? Mm -hmm. And maybe if I took a larger sample, those gaps would fill in. Maybe just happen to not pick a lot of things in here and here. So I'm picking fish. Maybe they were the ones that slipped through my fingers. Screw you, screw you. Okay, this one, right? Do you guys, you guys with me? Mm -hmm. So this is definitely, you know, approximately normal. And this one is loosely normal. I think they make a distinction in the book. So once you dr uh, draw your histogram, they're going to ask you, does it look normal or not? And then you just say, well, it goes has a small piece, goes up to a peak, and then it comes back down. That's normal. You could even see it from a, from just a table. Would you say that this is normal here? Uh, this is 
doesn't really matter. I'll leave him. Uh, Why? Because it starts low, low, goes high, comes back low. Is it perfect? No, but it's close. And for such a small sample, I'm like, well, that's decent evidence that it might be normal, this, especially if I picked it really nice and randomly. If I did a really good job of randomly picking, they should all grow proportional to this. I should get more in here, and these should kind of grow less Right? if I did a really good job of picking randomly. So it should kind of keep that same shape. I think there's one in the book where it like cuts right in half in the middle of the data. Like it starts going up like two, three, seven, and it cuts in half and asks you if you can figure out if it's normal curve or not. Like so, could you? Since it goes up. So oh, and like, like they're missing this. Yeah. And you can't tell. You can't tell. No, because it might be two, three, seven, zero, nine. Okay. Which is like, yeah, well, well, crap, and that's not normal, right? It it like had to do with um with ages or something. So I mean, you could kind of conclude that it would start to go back down. Well, it all depends. Yeah. I mean, right now, what's really funny is, I mean, what's the population, who are the oldest people in the population now? Are there more old people now than there were maybe 20 years ago? Yeah. Why? What's the two word phrase? We'll start with B. Boomers. Baby boomers, right? Aren't they all becoming retired pretty now or soon? So, so it's sort of like, it's sort of weird. It's like a wave, if you watch it, over time, here's here's what it looked like back in maybe the 70s, and and then this kind of moves up, right? Here they are, here they are, 30 years old, and now nowadays they're all 65, you know. So now it looks more like that. That's not perfect, obviously. There's little bumps. You always get these little tiny baby booms, right? Everybody heard the term baby boom, mm -hmm. baby boom? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So they're all going to retire, and the rest of us are going to pay for it, and we're all going to... I'm not sure what we're going to do. I think they will have enough of it. Yeah, Logan's run, everybody... No, it's not. <laughs> 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 um, let me see. I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble. All right. Uh, oh, and the last thing is, one definite uh, thing about normal histograms is they are symmetric, right? Or at least close to it if it's loosely normal. Meaning if you fold it, it would fold right on top of itself, right? So this would be a symmetric distribution. It's also a normal distribution. Uh, so if I had this, is that a symmetric distribution? No. Yes, it's not normal, is it? No. But is it symmetric? Mm -hmm. Good. So symmetric is a separate thing. It's symmetric because if you cut it in half, it'll fold right on top of itself. Cool. And this might be like heights of women and heights of men. We, we sort of saw that starting to happen in my little tiny sample. If I got 800 people, it would probably become more pronounced. A peak for the women, a peak for the men. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do today is we're going to try to finish out chapter two. A little bit of time I got left. The nice thing is the rest of chapter two is pretty simple. Right? Whenever I say that, I don't know if you trust me or not, but it's true. We're not going to do every single type of graph. That's one thing that's going to make this a lot easier. <coughs> I will tell you specifically what we will be doing. We'll be doing dot plots, stem and leaf plots, uh, and scatter plots. The rest of them, the frequency polygon, the ogive, uh, what else is in there? Pareto chart, bar graph, we're not going to circle graph, I'm not going to make you make a circle graph. Um, we're going to focus on these three because these are the three that are used most often. And this is the one that is used the most often. And they're all, each of these is kind of like either a quick way to, to sort data or a quick visual on the data itself. So a dot plot is exactly what you would hope it would be. It's a, it's a plot with dots on it. That's exciting. So a dot plot, if I had data like this, if I had ages of people, let's say, 
and they're already sorted for me. Okay, it's a very small sample, obviously. I want to give quick examples. So in the book, they're going to give you a list of data. If it's not sorted, I would first sort it. Right? A dot plot does exactly what it sounds like. Here's uh, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay. So make sure when you make your scale, it's consistent, and you can see all the data points. Don't do 18, 19, 20, 21, 24. Don't make it a damn bit of sense, right? I know I don't have any of these, but you better put that in the right place. Now here's the cool thing, yeah. Yes, you should put it in order first for most of the stuff we do. Alright, stay on. We'll look it out later. So here's the nice thing with the dot plot. What do you think I'm going to put on the 18? Dot. Yeah. How many dots? Three. Three of them. So one, two, three. Now, real quick word, if I had like 18.5, I'll put a dot right there. So don't start the dot off above the little line, the tick mark, because the heights are going to tell you what's going on. You don't want to give it a little uh, advantage. Don't start the first dot off higher than somebody else. See if you guys understand. What I mean. So if I had an 18.5, it would go there. It would be unfair if I did the 18 like that. It's higher than it should be. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a silly little thing to worry about. 19 would get two dots. 20, four dots, and 21, one dot, and 24, one dot. So you can answer a quick question here. You can say, um, does the data look normal? Maybe, not really. It's not enough data there really to tell, right? But it might be trying to go high and low, and that's an outlier, right? Mm -hmm. I'd have to collect more data to be really able to tell. They'll give you more data in the book and they'll ask you, tell me something about the data, a really good thing to say would be it looks normal, if it does. Uh, where's the tend to cluster? Where, where's the data tend to kind of group together? Like in here, right? Mm -hmm. And there's an outlier over there, so maybe this is uh, talking about high school students doing something, or people in a workshop uh, that high school students would go to, or something, you know, something like that, to explain why I have so many younger people in there. Okay. That's a dot plot. That's awesome. Right, so appreciate that. This section should be relatively straightforward. Creating a dot plot is really pretty simple. What about a stem and leaf? Has anybody ever heard of that? We'll use the same data here. Well, maybe not. Let me make some more data. I don't want to get too freaky yet. Yeah, let's see. Sort of got in order. Oh well. Okay, here's a stem and leaf. Let you guys copy that down if you want to. If you guys realize this, I want you to, chapter one was all definitions. Chapter two is how to present your data, you know, how to make a visual out of it. So we got histograms we can make, we got these other things we can make. We're not really yet into analyzing data, right? Once we get there, it's going to get more interesting, just in case anybody's like, all right, this is great. All right, we got to get through definitions and the basic how to display data. Um, stem and leaf. <coughs> my stems would be the first numbers there. So my stems would be 1, 2, 3, 4. So these numbers will be in the 10s and the 20s and the 30s. So my stems are 1. What comes off of 1? 7, 8, 9. All right, those are my leaves. So you put 7, 8, 9. Can you guys see that over there?
What we can off of two? Four, seven, nine, nine, nine. nine. Put repeats in there, right? Because that's going to make it the appropriate length. Yeah. Yeah, it didn't get uh, the first part. So see how I see a 17 oh. and 18? Oh. Yeah. So the stem, if it was in the hundreds, the stem could be like a one for a hundred. It could even be like a one one for 110, 111. So it depends on your data how much variation there is and how you want to pick your stem. What comes off of three? Four, and five and seven. And then four? One, five. Would you say that that's roughly normal? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's rough, really roughly normal, right? Slow, high, low. Very loosely normal, yeah. Um, if we had, for example, 24, 29, and then it jumps to 150 and 1,050, do you want Would to a stem and leaf be a really good way to represent that data? So behind everything I'm doing is actually, do I even want to do it this way for a given set of data? This data it makes sense for because they're all relatively close. But if I had 7, 11, 15, 20, 1,000, 1,050, stem and leaf sucks. Because you actually have to represent all the missing ones in the middle. So if I had one more data point, if I had a 63 in there, I still have to put a 5 and then a 6. So I can't skip it. Yeah, because you if you skip it, it's sort of like missing a bar on your histogram. You're not representing the data correctly. Mm. So don't skip it just because there's no 50s. That you have, then you have to show people there's no 50s. It's empty. You have to show people that. Good. Now is it now it looks you know it still looks kind of normal here a little bit, very roughly normal. Are we good with that? Okay, maybe maybe. Now the one thing that's missing here is if I just if I didn't have that data list, if I just looked at this. I can't tell if it's 17 or if it's 1.7, because it could be 1.7, 1.8. So I have to give a key. Key. 1, 7 means 17. I've actually had somebody do this problem, and their key, they listed everything. The key, that kind of defeats the purpose. The key should be one thing that sets a, a, a rule for everything else, right? OK, so just have to put it once. So don't forget your key. What if we have a mix of decimals and whole numbers? That's cool. The whole numbers just be like 2.0, 3.0. Right? So if I had a list like this, let's say uh, 1, 1.07, 1.09, 1.14, 1.20. 1.6. Here's where it gets interesting. What do you think my stem might be, my stems? If, if I just said one, there'd be one stem. What's the point then? So actually, my stem should be 1 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6. Do you see that? Oh, that's great. Break that one day. And then you come <laughs> off of there with your leaves. So what, what's the leaf for this going to be? Zero. Zero. 1.00. Oh. And then what would be next? Seven. Nine. Now where's 1.14 go? 1.14. 1.17. Seven. Cool. I like it. Do you guys see how to put that together? It's relatively simple. Even if the numbers get a little freaky, they're not going to give you any like the 5, 12, a billion. That's, that would be evil because you shouldn't do it steadily for that. They're going to make it relatively simple. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Now, on this one, you actually could do this. As long as in your key, the key for this one would be 1.00 means 1.00. If I did it like this, which is fine, I'd have to say the key 100 means 1.00. Because the important thing for a stem and leaf is number one, it's a really nice quick way to put your data in order. If this wasn't in order, then I just have to put these in order. It's quicker to put it in order then. Number two, at the end, I can get a visual, a really quick visual. I didn't have to make a histogram. That takes a little while to do that, right? 
I just have to put the data down. And I can kind of turn my head and look at it, and I can see, oh, that would be about normal. Right? Very quick visual on my data. So if I do it like this or like that, is it going to change the visual? Hell no. It's going to be the same length out there, right, at the end. It's still be the same visual. Okay. And then the last little thing here is something you've been doing for a long time. This is something called a scatter plot. So say I take uh, temperatures throughout the day, right? And I take it like at, at 8 a.m. it was uh, 68, 9 a.m. it was 72, 10 a.m. 74, 11 a.m. so forth. Right, that's enough there. Okay. All right. Hopefully, obviously, this is made up data. I have no idea if this is what it did. I actually have data points up there. Do I have a single set of data up there? Or do I have, how many variables do I have up here? I've got sure. time and I've got temperature. So I can represent this one as 868, 972, 1074. You guys with me? If I go further, I really actually here, I really should use um, military time just to make the scale better. Are you guys with me? Mm -hmm. You'll see this a lot if you look at tides, I think, at scripts. If you look at the tides, like I, I like to stick my kayak out. I like to know ahead of time what the tides look like. So they're going to use uh, military time to make the scale a little better, possibly. I can't remember now if they do or not. 11, 74. So to make a scatter plot, that's why I say you've been doing this forever, you just graph those x, y points. Right? So that's a scatter plot. You just graph those. So if I graph those, Uh, let's see. What should be this scale here? What should be here? Time. Time. And this should be temperature. Good. And this is Fahrenheit degrees. So we have 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And we have to represent from 68 up to 85. Can you just do like the little school thing on the bottom and then start it? Yes. Officially, I really should be putting this little heartbeat symbol there to tell them that there's a break. So I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm trying to show that I'm not trying to misrepresent data. I'm saying there's no data until eight. So don't really start at zero. I jump to eight. So the little squiggle means that. If you don't do the little squiggle, I'm okay with it. It's kind of understood nowadays. It doesn't, nothing, not everything starts at zero. So we're fine with that. Okay. Um, here it's going to be I want to get from 68 to 85. I think by five, this kind of naturally happens here, right? So now I can get, I can find 68 and I can find 85. And they just plot points. Uh, 8, 68, 9, 72, and so forth. I mean, you guys could do that. And of course, that'll give you a nice visual of what's going on with the temperature. You can do it the next day and overlay that and see if it's different. Right. Are there any surfers or kayakers out here? Surfers? Do you look at the tides and, you know, one day the low could be higher than the low was the previous day and so forth, right? So you want to kind of compare the peaks and the troughs to the day before. Yeah, cool. Okay. So that section should really, after the definitions and after the histogram, section 2.4 should be a nice little breather. Make these really simple little graphs, nothing too major. And sort of the same thing with section 2.5. Section 2.5 is another one of those common sense sections that some people kind of are scared of. But look, for example, this here. If uh, there was a teacher I didn't like and I said, you're, you're really starting to suck your dude. Last semester, here's last semester. Uh, your students had an average of uh, 
80. All right, so here, wow. This semester, your students had an average of 77. Look at that. Look at your performance. You suck. What's the most obvious thing that I've done to skew the data? The scale I picked is stupid. Right? Now, I know this scale doesn't start at zero, but it's not that big of a deal here. We kind of know 65 degrees. I, most days are not zero degrees. We're cool with that. But this scale, really, to be fair, should start at zero to show true differences then. Right? If I started it at zero instead, this is zero, and I want to get up to 80. Uh, let's do it by 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. So last semester he would have been 80, and this semester he's 77. Now that oh, should be the same. Now that's a little more accurate, isn't it? Now do you guys see why I have a gap here? Because this is not a true histogram. This is these are uh, new, uh, qualitative data. Last semester, this semester. Now this obviously states the what's going on better. 77 and 80 are not that really far apart. That overstates it, trying to make, trying to skew the data, make a different point. This is why people don't like statistics because most of us don't know statistics well enough to realize when we're trying to be duped. Or when you create a graph, you could accidentally create it so that you're duping people or you're duping yourself. You're like, oh crap, look at that. When you don't really know how to make a good graph. So that's why statistics kind of throws people off because they don't know how to interpret it or how to use it correctly, right? So this section is all about um, what did they do wrong? What were they? How are they trying to mislead us? This is a common sense section. You know, what, what's a better way to do this? What's a better way to make this graph, right? One last little thing: you never want to make a graph out of. Um, let me see if you guys can get this. If I have a box that one by one by one. What's the volume in the box? One, one. one. good, right, length times width times height. If the next, if this is like taxes, the year before I was voted into office, and then the next year they say, oh, you doubled taxes, so now it's a uh, two by two by two. <laughs> but what's the volume in that box? Eight. eight, two times two times two is eight. You're saying that taxes went up eight times as much. You're misleading people. When they see the little box and the giant ass box, they're going, Whoa, get him out of office, oh my god. When that's overstating the case, you can't use a three-dimensional object for a one-dimensional thing, taxes. You should use a one-dimensional object, or a bar graph is better, right, to make the scale correctly. So those kind of things are going to show up in section 2.5. So just to warn you, chapter 3 is coming up. That's where we're going to start doing real analysis of data. We're going to use our calculators a lot. So if you got one coming or you don't have one yet, you want to try to get one, I will bring a few with me. So next time, chapter three, means and standard deviations and such. Uh,